It's my pleasure to introduce Alicia Morgan. She's an associate professor of medical oncology at Northwestern. Uh, she comes to us after undergoing training at medical school and residency at UPenn, and then did her fellowship at Dana-Harbor. Um, she worked at Vanderbilt for about five years before moving to Northwestern, so she has that connection as well. She, her clinical interest in addition to GU oncology specifically is uh, prostate cancer survivorship and also the deleterious effects of androgen deprivation therapy on quality of life. And she's a member of, uh, of a couple of different cooperative groups and um, certainly a very accomplished faculty member. So it's a pleasure to have her. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak. Um, I've been, I've not been to Oklahoma before, which is my mistake. I don't travel very much. So I was so excited to be here. And thank you for the opportunity um, and for such a warm welcome. So there have been a lot of updates in the pharmacologic therapies that we have for men with prostate cancer in the last few years. I was just talking to some folks about this at lunch. And there's been actually a, an entire new disease state that this M0 or non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer um, for which we now have therapies um, where we didn't have them before. So that's what we're going to talk about, this M0 or non-metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer new therapeutic space. Thank you. So these are my disclosures. Um, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Janssen, Sanofi, Genentech, Seattle Genetics, and Estellas have all given me honoraria or paid me for consulting in some way or another, or have paid um, fees for work that I've done with them on research. So the learning objectives today, um, we're hoping to, uh, by the end of this uh, talk, identify high-risk patients with castration-resistant biochemical recurrence to treat with initial ADT before they become castration-resistant. So patient selection for that, and then also patient selection for the non-metastatic CRPC setting. Understand the data that led to the FDA approval of apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide, all now approved for this new disease state. Um, and recognize the side effects associated with the different androgen receptor uh, antagonist treatments, these three, apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide. Um, and when we think about the professional practice gap, actual practice behaviors include misidentification of high-risk patients, potentially treating all patients, not just identifying the high-risk patients that need treatment, um, and a lack of knowledge about side effects of medications that are just newly approved that we need to have more experience with. Um, so here's our outline. We'll go through some background. We'll talk about high-risk patients. And then we'll go through all the three studies that really led to the approval of these new drugs for M0 CRPC. So I think everyone here knows prostate cancer is exceedingly common, most common non-cutaneous cancer in American men today. Um, and although the majority of patients are diagnosed with localized disease that many of the audience treat and take care of, up to 40% will actually develop recurrent disease at some point during their follow-up. Um, and the median time to biochemical recurrence for those high-risk patients is about two to three years. And, and PSA doubling time is really going to be very strongly associated with survival in these patients, and that's something on which we're going to focus as we think about treatment decisions. When patients develop biochemical recurrence, we think about what is the best way to treat them. And these are the NCCN guidelines that are put together by you know, the, the medical oncologists and urologists um, and radiation oncologists who work together to put this guidance together. And they really suggest that for biochemical recurrence for all comers, observation, no treatment, is actually preferred and that it is high-risk patients who should be selected for initial systemic therapy. If you are going to use systemic therapy, intermittent therapy is potentially um, equivalent to continuous androgen deprivation therapy. So again, picking out those patients who actually need treatment and, and deferring treatment in those who don't need it, uh, continuously at least. And those patients who may be at highest risk are those patients with a high Gleason score greater than or equal to 8, and a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. These may be the patients with the most aggressive disease who need some intervention. So how do you know who these these patients are that have the highest risk disease. Where did that greater than or equal to 8 and PSA doubling time less than or equal to 10 come from? Well, there are multiple natural history cohorts from which we uh, have gotten this data. This is one of the older studies, one of the first studies, the POUND study that was actually published back in 1999. This looked at just under 2,000 men who had undergone prostatectomy at Hopkins. And of those nearly 2,000 men, 315 actually developed biochemical recurrence. 
of those patients, only 34% of these patients who had biochemical recurrence ultimately developed metastatic disease. So of that entire cohort of 2,000, that's actually quite a small amount of patients. The median time to biochemical recurrence was eight years, and the median time to metastatic disease after biochemical recurrence was another five years. Um, and then uh, from metastasis to death, I'm sorry, was another five years. So um, this was a 13-year period from biochemical recurrence to death. So of all these patients, many of them actually did not need treatment, would potentially die of other causes, or wouldn't develop metastatic disease to begin with. So that's why it's really important for us to think about who is the high-risk patient. Some of this data comes from a group, uh, Steve Freeland's group, um, also working with Dr. Parton. This was a retrospective cohort study of just under 400 men after prostatectomy who developed biochemical recurrence, and they looked at causes of prostate cancer-specific mortality after biochemical recurrence. Uh, when they looked at the specific factors that might be associated, PSA doubling time came out very strongly associated with the risk of prostate cancer death from biochemical recurrence. Um, and you can see here in this figure that the shorter your PSA doubling time, the greater your risk of developing prostate cancer-specific death or dying from prostate cancer. So if we compare PSA doubling time greater than or equal to 15 months, which is the top line on this figure here, uh, and then look at their survival of those patients who have a PSA doubling time of 9 to 14.9 months versus 3 to, 3 to 9 months, basically, and all the way down for a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 3 months, you can see an increasing risk of dying from prostate cancer as that PSA doubling time goes down. In a separate study looking at non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, this was a study looking at denosumab for prevention of metastatic disease. We saw a very similar phenomenon that as the PSA doubling time went down, specifically around the eight to nine month point, um, the risk of dying from prostate cancer actually dramatically went up. So another set of data that suggests that this doubling time is really important in terms of predicting who's highest risk of dying from prostate cancer. So the AUA has been very responsive to the data that's been coming out and trying to help guide us as we think through treatment of these patients. And they have specific guidelines for castration-resistant prostate cancer, um, came out last year, and they have a specific patient population, this index one, that's the non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer population. Um, until this update in 2018, they didn't really have level one evidence to support treatment recommendations there other than maybe bicalutamide, observation, ketoconazole. But um, on their latest update, they actually have updated based on the new uh, treatments that have been approved for non-metastatic CRPC. So there is level, uh, level one grade A evidence um, for offering apalutamide and enzalutamide, or, or enzalutamide, to patients who have non-metastatic CRPC. And I don't know that it's been updated yet, but darolutamide was actually also just approved in this setting. And, and why is the AUA recommending this? So this is in patients who have a short PSA doubling time that's rising. Um, so the PSA doubling time is shrinking, and the patient's PSA is rising. Um, and we need to identify that high-risk patient. Um, so why did that come about? We'll go through that data in just a minute. The NCCN also is recommending this for patients to get darolutamide, apalutamide, enzalutamide uh, in this patient population. So, so why? There were three landmark trials that we're going to review. The first is the PROSPER trial, which was published in the New England Journal last year. This was looking at enzalutamide in patients who have non-metastatic CRPC. This is the schema for that trial. Patients with non-metastatic CRPC were identified. These had, patients had been on ADT for their biochemical recurrence and had a PSA doubling time that was less than or equal to 10 months. And this was to select a high-risk patient population to treat because some patients may never develop metastatic disease. And we did have evidence from that denosumab trial that if you shorten your PSA doubling time, that will identify a high-risk patient population. They um, underwent central review of imaging, had no metastatic disease on standard CT or bone scan. They could have metastatic disease by things like Aximan PET or PSMA PET, but by standard imaging, they had no metastatic disease. And they were randomized to treatment with continued ADT for, for everybody, but randomized then to treatment with enzalutamide or placebo. And they were followed for a novel endpoint, metastasis-free survival which is the development of metastatic disease or death from disease. They were stratified by their PSA doubling time and use of bone-targeted agents. 
When we look at the baseline characteristics for the patients on the PROSPER trial, which are going to be very similar, you'll see, to the Spartan and the Aramis trials as well. Um, these were men who had a median age around their early 70s, so 74. They were all in very good performance status, so they had predominantly an ECOG performance status of zero. Um, and their median PSA doubling time was under four months in this trial. So this was a really high-risk patient population. And when we look at the metastasis-free survival in this trial, we found that the metastasis-free survival was actually 22 months longer in those patients treated with enzalutamide than those patients who were treated with placebo. And all patients, remember, were continued on ADT. Um, and so that's a pretty impressive separation of curves. And remember, this is the risk of metastasis or death. So this metastasis-free survival is really a novel endpoint in terms of being a regulatory endpoint. It was explored when there was a slight increase in metastasis-free survival associated with denosumab in the non-metastatic CRPC setting. But that, sort of, that benefit in terms of MFS was so short that the FDA did not give them approval for that, for that endpoint. However, in this setting, uh, enzalutamide actually has been approved for the non-metastatic CRPC patient population based on this 22-month improvement in MFS. So this is the development of metastatic disease or death from disease or from any cause, and it's really deemed to be clinically meaningful both to patients and to their families. Um, and for this particular trial, overall survival is not yet mature, though that is being followed as well. Adverse events are impossible for you to see, but essentially we're very similar to what we saw in Prevail and Affirm. So there were some patients who developed some hypertension, there were some patients who had some fatigue and some amnestic type events, but generally it was very well tolerated. Um, and the rates were similar in terms of serious adverse events between the two arms. Um, when we look at those specific uh, AEs that are really important for this particular drug, hypertension, as I said, falls and some anestic events, those were similar. There were actually um, really, there were very few seizures, but there was a seizure on this trial. Patient reported outcomes and quality of life are also critically important. These, uh, the, the quality of life of someone who's asymptomatic at baseline and for whom we wouldn't necessarily even use treatment before this was approved is really critically important. And there are many men who say, well, I'm feeling fine. I don't even have metastatic disease. I certainly don't want to feel worse when I'm on treatment. So what can you tell me about how I'll feel when I'm on this therapy? So this, I think, was very important information, and it suggested that quality of life was maintained for men who were on treatment as compared to the placebo. So they didn't feel worse on treatment, at least according to the instruments that were used to measure quality of life in this study. So moving on to the Spartan trial, which looked at apalutamide, again in this non-metastatic CRPC setting, the schema is surprisingly similar. Maybe not so surprisingly, because I think some of the same people advised on how to, to do this schema. But in any event, um, it was non-metastatic, castration-resistant prostate cancer patients who had a doubling time, a PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. So again, trying to really identify a high-risk patient population. I should mention that the FDA approvals for these three drugs do not uh, stipulate what your PSA doubling time must be. This is really something that we just think about or I think about in my clinic in terms of choosing a treatment when a patient actually needs the treatment um, because if you have a PSA doubling time of 15 or, or 20 months, perhaps you don't need treatment at that moment. Perhaps you can spare the financial toxicity at least of paying for these drugs, if, even if not the quality of life issues that we saw on the, the FACT-P instrument a few minutes ago. But in any event, the trials were designed around all high-risk patients, PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. Men were randomized two to one to apalutamide or placebo pills in, in addition to continued ADT for everybody, and they were followed for metastasis-free survival. I should say that in this particular trial, men could have pelvic lymph nodes up to two centimeters and st on standard imaging and still be considered non-metastatic. But again, standard imaging was otherwise negative. Even if you had a positive axiom PET, PSMA PET, but otherwise a negative imaging, standard imaging, bone scan and CT scan, you could be included in this trial. The demographics at baseline were very similar to what we saw a moment ago with a similar median age of 74, PSA doubling time just over four months, um, and these were very well patients as well. And you can see that the metastasis-free survival, which was the primary endpoint, was actually very similar to 22-month improvement in MFS for apalutamide as compared to placebo.
The adverse events were notable for being pretty similar, slightly higher risk of adverse events, three and four events, with apalutamide as compared to placebo, but very similar, again, in terms of a rate as compared to placebo um, as the PROSPER study that I just showed you. Um, these patients did seem to develop some fatigue, hypertension as well. Unique side effects associated with, um, with apalutamide include rash, which can occur in about 10% of patients or maybe a little higher, and hypothyroidism, which is a little bit unique and different. We're not exactly sure what that mechanism is, but that is a distinct um, and unique side effect in apalutamide. These patients also did seem to have a slightly increased risk of fall, similar to those patients treated with enzalutamide. We looked at fracture. It was slightly higher in the apalutamide arm. Um, I mentioned the hypothyroidism. Some cognitive slowing, perhaps. A very, very, there was one seizure in the trial. So when we think about, again, quality of life, this was maintained in the apalutamide arm as compared to the placebo arm. Um, so again, very similar to enzalutamide in the PROSPER trial, this led to the approval of apalutamide in the non-metastatic CRPC setting. Darolutamide was studied in the Aramis trial, and um, I'm, I'm sure that this schema looks familiar because it is pretty much exactly the same as the other two. This was patients with non-metastatic CRPC, PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months, randomized two to one, this case to darolutamide versus placebo pills, followed again for metastasis-free survival endpoint. Again, median age, 74, the PSA doubling time was just over four, and these were well patients as well. And here you can see, again, similar separation of curves, 22 months improvement in uh, metastasis-free survival for this patient population. And AEs in this were also very slightly higher in darolutamide versus placebo. Um, but generally, there may have been less fatigue, less fall. Um, again, this is pretty hard to see, but um, certainly if anyone asks after the meeting, I'm happy to give you the citations to, to look at these in more detail. The, the sense among the com community is that darolutamide may have slightly fewer side effects than the other two, but until these are all compared head to head, I think it's really hard to tell. Um, but there were a few, these were generally similar in terms of rates of side effects, at least in terms of darolutamide with placebo here. They, as I said, had fewer fractures and falls um, as, as compared to placebo than the other two, so didn't seem to necessarily increase that. Um, and generally, this was very well tolerated. There was an analysis just presented at ASCO this year that suggested that quality of life was actually improved in certain domains on darolutamide as compared to placebo, so not just maintained. Um, it was improved in terms of urinary and, um, and bowel symptoms um, in this particular trial, which is interesting because in a biochemical recurrent population, generally these are going to be patients who have had local treatment to their, to their prostate, and so you would imagine that there would be fewer bowel or urinary symptoms anyway, but in any event, these symptoms were improved. So to summarize all of this, uh, selection of patients is really important in biochemical recurrence and important, I think, too, in the non-metastatic CRPC setting. In my clinic, I try to use that greater or, or PSA doubling time of less than 10 months to identify the patients who are at highest risk of developing metastatic disease so that I have an, a, a benchmark on which I can judge when to start treatment. So if a PSA doubling time is 20 months, I usually do not start treatment for non-metastatic CRPC. The AUA guidelines recommend that cl clinicians should offer apalutamide or enzalutamide um, with continued ADT to patients with this sort of newer disease state, this non-metastatic CRPC, or newer at least in terms of having treatment options. Um, and it, we can prolong metastasis-free survival in men with the PSA doubling time of less than or equal to 10 months. But just to be clear, the label does not describe the PSA doubling time. Um, and so you actually could use this for any patient that you like. Um, with non-metastatic CRPC. Quality of life appears to be maintained for men treated with apalutamide, enzalutamide, and darolutamide as compared to ADT alone. Um, but there are specific adverse events associated with each. Apalutamide has hypothyroidism and a rash. Enzalutamide is associated with falls and some hypertension. Um, and darolutamide seems to have maybe fewer side effects, but any drug that you give a patient certainly could have at least financial toxicity because these are not inexpensive medications to, to deal with. So, that is the end of, of this talk, and I appreciate your time.